If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Colossians chapter 2. As we continue our study of Colossians, and this morning we'll be looking at uh, verses 9 through 15. I'll just go through those verses as we, uh, in the context of the sermon. So let me pray for us. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to listen like one being taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not disobedient, nor did I turn back. Amen. Well, in these verses that are very rich, there's a lot here. Um, Paul is talking about Christ's triumph over the tomb and over death and the shadow of his victory that falls on us as Christians. He wants us to know the reality of Christ's victory and how that should impact our lives today as Christians. That's what he's talking about this morning the implications that our Lord's victory has for us. So see with me then three things in our text. First of all, we see Paul's claim concerning Christ in verse 9. Secondly, our completeness in Christ as Christians in verse 10 And then thirdly, the challenge to us in the light of Christ's victory, his resurrection, and our union with him in that victory, and what that should mean for us in daily living. So we see, first of all then, Paul's claim concerning Christ. Look at verse 9. Paul says, For in him... All the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Now he's speaking here of Christ's deity, of his complete equality in essence with the Father. The Nicene Creed puts it like this, being of the same substance with the Father. The shorter catechism, which we read just a few minutes ago, says there is one God existing in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, these being the same in substance, equal in power and glory. Now, verse 9 also speaks of the incarnation. It says the fullness of deity in bodily form. That's God inhabiting a human body. So we don't need to look anywhere else for salvation or for spiritual growth or for spiritual maturity. That's what Paul is dealing with here. Those who were telling these Christians that Christ was not enough. You had to have more. You had to have higher Gnostic experiences, or you needed to worship other deities, and so forth. But Paul says, no. Christ is all you need because in him, the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Secondly, we see our completeness in Christ. Look at the first part of verse 10. And in him you have been made complete. In Christ, when we are joined to him, we're plugged into the source that supplies what we need for spiritual life and for the life to come. And that has profound implications for us in our daily living. We're complete in him. Notice Christ's position. Look at the second part of verse 10. He is head over all rule and authority. 
Jesus is head or in charge of the universe. Remember what he said, all authority, all power is given to me in heaven and on earth. So he's in charge of all rule and authority. That means that good angels won't help you without his assignment, and evil angels can't touch you without his permission. He's head over all. In verse 11, Paul elaborates on our completeness. Notice what he says. And in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. And here Paul is speaking of our completeness in terms of our spiritual renewal. If you're a Christian, Paul says you don't need external circumcision, which is what was being taught by these false teachers. They said if you really want to be spiritual, if you uh, want maturity, you have to be circumcised. And Paul says no. He says, if you're a Christian, you already have what circumcision symbolizes. We have the internal circumcision of the heart. We've had a heart operation that has put off the sins of the flesh. That's what happens when we come to Christ, when we're converted, when we have a spiritual rebirth. Christ has cut away our sinful nature. Now, it's not totally removed, but the back of it has been broken through this heart operation that Christ has done in us. The reigning power of our sinful nature, which dominated our lives before, has now been broken. Spiritually, we are renewed. And in the light of that, we are new creatures in Christ, and we need not let sin dominate our lives any longer. Now, it'll try to, and sometimes we lose the battle, right? But its back has been broken. The other side of this coin is that a spiritual resurrection has taken place in our lives as well. And Paul speaks of this in verse 12. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. What Christ experienced physically, a death and resurrection, we have experienced spiritually, if we're Christians. And just as real as his physical resurrection was, so is our spiritual resurrection. The same power that was operative in his physical resurrection is operating in you and me. And it's raised us spiritually. It's made us spiritually alive. It's given us power now to live a supernatural life, a resurrected life, a life different than the way we used to live. Our union with Christ in his burial and resurrection has brought this about. Verse 12 says we were buried with him in baptism. Now that's not speaking of water baptism. Rather, water baptism is a symbol of what Paul's talking about here. This is the baptism of the Spirit, an inner baptism. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body. You know, if I could take a portion of my human spirit and place it in each one of you, you'd be a part of me. You'd be an extension of my body. That's what's happened to us in Christ. 
We were also raised up with him, verse 12 says. Made spiritually alive with him. Now how does that happen? Has that happened to you? Well, on our part, the means is faith. Look at verse 12. Raised us up with him through faith. Faith in God's power as manifested in the resurrection of Christ. When we realize our need of a Savior and we believe his claims to be God become a man, that he died and rose from the dead to make payment for our sinfulness, when we believe those things to be true, that's part of faith. But it's only one side of the coin. See, that's the intellectual side, the intelligent part of it. I believe that my whole life. Most people in this part of the country who grow up going to church believe that intellectually. But saving faith, the kind of faith that gets me into heaven, well, there's another step involved. And that involves putting feet to what we say that we believe. It's putting our complete trust and hope in Him as our Savior. And then it's committing our wills to Him. Everybody trusts in something. A Christian is someone who has turned away from trusting in his own goodness, his own track record, his own church attendance to get him into heaven. And instead, he's trusting in or resting completely on Christ's perfect life and his sacrifice on the cross as his only hope of heaven. He believes that Jesus died for his sins and Christ is now his Lord, his master, his boss. That's our part of all of this. Many people say they have prayed to receive Christ, but have they surrendered? Have they turned the deed of their lives over to him? That's part of saving faith, repentance. The, our shorter catechism, we read a question earlier, well, question 87 asks this, what is repentance unto life? And the answer, repentance unto life is a saving grace. In other words, God's got to work that in our hearts too. Whereby a sinner out of a true sense of his sin Okay, the, the, the first thing, no one's ready to receive a Savior or hear that story until they first see a need. And most people don't see a need. Or if they do, they suppress it. But it's out of apprehension or a true sense of his sin and, it doesn't stop there, apprehension of the mercy of God in Christ Jesus. Simultaneously, I see I need a Savior. I'm in trouble. But I also see at the same time God's mercy and his love and that he's offered me a way and I embrace that. Apprehension of the mercy of God in Christ does with grief and hatred of his sin turn from it unto God with full purpose of and endeavor after new obedience. Lord, I'm tired of doing it my way. I want to do it your way now. And when that really happens, it always results in a changed life. That's why Jesus said and uh, taught that you'll know a tree how? Not by its profession, by its fruit, right? A good tree can't be, bring forth bad fruit. A bad tree can't bring forth good fruit. That's why Jesus said in Luke 6, 46, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but you don't do the things I say? The profession of faith is not valid if there's not a lifestyle that supports it. Now, that lifestyle is full of flaws, but there's a lifestyle there. That's what he's talking about. So we see our part. 
But notice who initiates this process in our lives. Look at verse 13. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, <clears throat> he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions. See, formerly we were dead spiritually. We're all born that way. That's how we come into the world. That's why you never have to teach a baby how to be disobedient, right? That's natural. That's in keeping with their nature. What we do from day one is we try to do the opposite. We try to start teaching them how to not be so self-centered and not be selfish and so forth. We were all dead spiritually. We were dead in our sins in the uncircumcision of our flesh. Our flesh dominated our lives. We hadn't had that heart operation. See, that was our former condition. It's still the condition of many people today. It was my condition the first 18 years of my life, even though I grew up going to church, attended church very regularly. Only Christ can change that. Only he can take our hard heart, spiritually remove it, and give us a new soft heart that has his desires and his law written on it so that we want to live differently. We want to live a life pleasing to him. That's what the new birth is. He puts his spirit in us. He makes us alive, enables us to live according to his will. Formerly that hadn't happened. See, and that's why we live the way that we wanted to live. But then a miracle happened. It says in verse 13, he made you alive with Christ. That's a miracle. He raised you up spiritually. He performed a spiritual resurrection in your life. You were dead, now you're alive. Think about Lazarus in that tomb. He was dead. And then Jesus called him. Lazarus, come forth. And his call was a quickening call. It was an effectual call, a call that produced life in Lazarus. And once he had been given life, Lazarus responded, and he came forth. We, too, responded to the gospel by repenting and believing. But what produced that life in us so that we could respond in a saving way was Jesus' quickening us. Him breathing life into us. And what Paul is telling us in our passage is that our spiritual renewal is complete in Christ. Okay, now that doesn't mean we don't need to grow. We do need to grow. <clears throat> but we don't need anything else to make us complete in our spiritual renewal. Not only are we complete in our spiritual renewal, but we're also complete in our legal standing before God. Look at the last part of verse 13. Having forgiven us all our transgressions. Our former state was one of guilty, one of condemned, one of doomed. But having come to Christ... <clears throat> now we stand before the judge of the universe as someone who is not guilty. Now, how is that possible? How is that accomplished? Well, Paul tells us in verse 14. <clears throat> Having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. What a glorious verse. You and I had a certificate of debt consisting of decrees, a list of our offenses against God. And it's a long list. And God took that certificate and he put it on that cross 
and he nailed it down. Anyone fail to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Anybody fail to love your neighbor as yourself? You ever coveted something that didn't belong to you? Well, if you're a Christian, that certificate consisting of decrees against you was hung on that cross with Jesus, and it was nailed there. All our guilt was credited to him, and he voluntarily took it upon himself and paid our debt in full. The wrath of God that was our due upon the Lamb was laid. And by the shedding of his blood, <clears throat> the debt for us was paid. So, we're completing our spiritual renewal and in our legal standing before God. Thirdly, we're also complete in our struggle against the powers of darkness against us. Look at what he says in verse 15. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. These rulers and authorities are angelic beings who resist God and who seek to lure us into sin. They want to ruin our souls. They want to ruin our lives. They lead men captive. But Paul says Christ has spoiled them. He's disarmed them. He's stripped them of their armor at his first coming. And then he showed his triumph publicly he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him, he says in verse 15. I like the way F.F. F. Bruce translates this verse in his commentary. He says this, He grappled with these principalities and powers and mastered them, stripping them of all the armor in which they trusted and held them aloft in his mighty outstretched hands, displaying to the universe their helplessness and his own unvanquished strength. Christ did all of this in his resurrection. So, we see Paul's claim concerning Christ, God in a human body. We see our completeness in Christ. We're complete in our spiritual renewal. We're complete in our legal standing. And we're complete in our struggle against the powers of darkness. Finally, let's talk about the challenge to us. First of all, as Christians, what are we going to do in the light of what has been done for us? Well, we must strive, and it's a daily struggle, to enter into his victory, his triumph. Enter into it in terms of the completeness of our spiritual renewal. We can pursue holiness now. We can pursue holiness of life. We're complete in our spiritual renewal. We don't have to live the way that we used to. To live. We can be different. We don't have to be conquered or dominated by anger anymore or lust or addictions or selfishness. Remember, we have been raised spiritually and we can walk in the power of our spiritual resurrection. We can walk in the Spirit, in the power of the Holy Spirit. Moment by moment, day by day, we can bear the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control. Enter in to that victory. Secondly, we need to remember our legal standing and enter into his victory for us there also. We can shake off our guilty fears. 
We can shake off condemnation. We can preach the gospel to ourselves and to one another and walk in the freedom that Christ won for us. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather who was raised, who's at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Think about that. Jesus intercedes for you. Ask him to do it. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or peril or sword? But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced, Paul says, that neither death nor life nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing. That means that's everything, right? Shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Finally, in the light of his victory over the powers of darkness... We can put on the full armor of God every day. And you know what? We can go outside these doors and we can claim other men's lives. The back of the serpent has been broken. Darkness has been broken. He has to yield. He has to yield. The gospel is the power of salvation to everyone who believes. Let's go rescue men. Let's pray together. What about you? What about me? If you had that heart operation that Christ offers, have you experienced a spiritual resurrection where the power of sin has been broken in your life? Or is your legal standing before God still one of guilty? It is if you've never truly cried out to Christ and asked Him to come into your life to cleanse you of a guilty conscience and then turn control of your life over to Him. You can do that right now. You can ask Him to raise you from the dead, spiritually speaking, to breathe new life into your soul. Pray like this, Lord Jesus, I need a spiritual resurrection. I am guilty, but I thank you that you died to take away my guilt. Come into my life right now. Give me a spiritual resurrection. And from this moment on, make me the kind of person that you want me to be. Amen. Thank you.